Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, Happy New Year, and welcome to the first community roundup of 2024. So if you're new here, this is where we take a look at interesting things happening in and around the Blender community, involving different art projects, tutorials, conversations, and things you might not know about that have been happening recently. Before we get into it, I want to let you know this video is sponsored by a member of our community using our casual sponsor system, and today's sponsor is Martin Swears. Martin is otherwise known as Not Important Studio, and a little while later in the video I'm going to tell you about their NIS Light Pack, which will help you to get much more realistic reflection in Blender is pretty cool actually. It's a bit similar to a product that I actually wanted to make, so I think you'll find it interesting. But like I said, we'll talk a bit more about that later on. But for now, let's take a look at what's been happening. So first of all, I think I should mention that it was Blender's birthday recently. It is now technically 30 years old and they did a donation drive recently, December last year, to try and raise some more funds for the software. They called each donation a gift and there was this lovely interactive page where you could see everyone's donations kind of like falling down in a 2D rigid body type sim on the webpage. They raised over 10,000 gifts, which is great, divided between single donations and development fund members, uh, which I recommend signing up for, by the way, if you have any disposable money available. And if you use Blender, then it's definitely a worthwhile cause to donate to. And to go along with this, they released a really funny video, Happy Birthday Blender, on the official channel to a familiar piece of music. I won't spoil it, but it was a lovely celebratory moment that I recommend checking out. And I do also want to give a bit of an apology to Francesco, because they did send me an email, and I did get it, by the way, letting me know about this donation drive and asking whether I would be interested in sharing the message with people. But unfortunately, I was preoccupied in December. I basically took a break the whole month. Family holidays, getting some dental surgery done, and then getting ill a few times. So sorry, but hopefully this makes up for it a bit. If you can, join the rest of us creator brethren in signing up for the development fund. Anyway, moving on, there's a product I've been keeping my eye on recently. Now, this is not sponsored. Physical Open Waters by Physical Add-ons. Now, as I've said in previous videos, I love physical add-ons. I love their approach to things, and they're also just really nice people. If I could, I would like to miniaturize the development team and keep them on my desk. I think they're very sweet. But the thing I like about their tools is there's just such a realistic approach to them, which I haven't seen in other add-ons. What I mean is like, for example, with the Celestial Objects add-on they do, they didn't want to compromise with trying to recreate real scale planets inside of the actual 3D view. So they decided to render all the planets in the world shader, which is so much more difficult and mathematical, but it means you can get real scale visuals. So that's what I like about these tools, difficult approaches, for good results. So this is the newest tool in their collection. Still brand new, so a lot of work to be done, but Physical Open Waters is about simulating, well, open waters, seas, ocean environments. It seems like an absolute must-have kind of tool if you're into large-scale environment design, and especially short films, because the water is also animated. Uh, one thing I also appreciate is that on the store page, you can get a quick breakdown of the things to come, and one of the ones which I'm especially interested in seeing how they tackle is the transition to underwater. This is something that you see a lot in video games. Games, right? It's a traditional problem of a first person camera moving from above water to below water. A lot of older video games kind of just cheated a little bit by making that a one frame difference, right? So you're above and then you're below and there's like no in between. But then, you know, over time, game developers got a bit creative to the point where they implemented like this transition line, which is cool. Like it looks like water going over your eyeballs, which is weird. So that's something typically quite tricky to do. I'm interested in seeing what kinds of results the physical add-ons team end up coming up with. Okay, well, not everyone's interested in tools and add-ons, so let's take a look at some artwork. Now, there's a young artist that I think deserves a lot of attention, who I want to give a bit of a shout out because I've been really appreciating the kind of artwork they've been doing recently. So Nugget, I've always known as Hot Dog Nugget, who I have actually recommended in some older videos, has been doing some what I would describe as architectural dioramic artworks with a brutalist style and an emphasis on scale distribution. I sound like an art connoisseur, like, you know, someone stuck up in an art museum. Now, let me show you what I mean. So we have this one here called Concrete Hell. One thing I like about this is it's incredibly detailed, right? And it's a good demonstration of how small details can give you a sense of scale. But when you break this down, it's actually quite a simple art piece. We have very simple geometries going on here. The cylinders, the cubic bevels on the side there, and basically just very limited shapes, which are made realistic with much more finer surface texture details and an easy to understand distribution of medium and small shapes. You see, shape scale distribution is one of the more important things about making something look visually cohesive. It's something that a lot of newer artists trip up on actually. They even make surfaces which are just like far too flat and large or they try and cram as much detail as possible into like every crevice. But something that actually kind of transcends most creative fields is balance. And the same thing goes for music as well. If you just cram a bunch of like dubstepy sounds into every nanosecond of the track then it's just noise in the end. But if you stretch the sound out into recognizable 
patterns and moments of intensity and then moments of rest, then it becomes a much more enjoyable experience. So let's take a look at another piece of artwork. Here's another one animated as well. So again, I think these are important for new artists to take a look at because it's just a good demonstration of these simple principles being used to make something that's visually appealing. Now this work is actually not entirely original. According to Nugget, it's been inspired by the work of Lee Madgwick, who I might have pronounced the name wrong, it's a bit of a unique name. But let's take a look at some of Lee's work. You can see here the distilled mood of what Nugget's tried to capture. And it's a very unique style, again, like architectural dioramic, basically something in the center of the frame with a focus on a mundane architecture, the kind of stuff that you might walk past on the street without even realizing it. And these are good study elements for basically testing those composition and distribution skills. So again, another reason I want to share the work of Nugget is not just because of their artwork, they also have a very technical mind as well. Now you may know that I love doing procedural materials in Blender, I've got some products related to that. Well, Nugget had an idea for a geometry nodes powered ray traced map generation system, where you can create ambient occlusion, curvature, thickness for texturing. And you can see here how incredible that is for procedural materials. Put some of mine to shame. The detail here is amazing. Nugget is a much better procedural artist than I am, and uh, hopefully I will be able to get to their level someday. And this is really good inspiration for when I start tackling the next version of my modular metals product as well. Nugget, if you're watching, I may have to pick your brain because this work is excellent. Speaking of Blender artists that I think you might find inspiring, I have a question for you. Have you ever seen an artist where you look at their work and you think, oh my god, that is me. That is my style, just like perfectly encapsulated and condensed. I can't believe I didn't make that myself. What the hell is going on? Well, I found an artist that kind of encapsulates that feeling for me. And it turns out they're actually a watcher of the channel as well, which is really cool. So when I think about my own artwork, I think, well, I do a lot of blues and purples. That's something I was known for in terms of just a, a color scheme. I've done a variety of like ancient artwork type stuff, cultural elements, and I love nature, although that's something I want to explore more in the future. I love emissive lighting. We've done so much work with that. And also structurally, liminal spaces, places which feel like they could be lived in, but are stuck in between time. Okay, with all that in mind, let's take a look at the work of Brelius, or Brelius, whose name I probably pronounced wrong, but ta-da! <laughs> this is the kind of thing where I look at it and I go, yep, this is pretty much exactly what I would make if I was just committed to the act of just making 3D artwork. Even bringing in some of those like No Man's Sky sci-fi vibes, a little bit of interior liminality. This even reminds me of like some kind of dream I had. So I just wanted to throw their name out there as a potential source of inspiration again. I'm even seeing some Stalin Hagian inspiration here. Seems like this one's a collaboration with Kitbash 3D. Oh my god, you even went full Egyptian? Interesting. Yeah, another Kitbash collaboration. Remember, I have a little collection of Egyptian artifacts, but for good reasons, I should say, not for colonial reasons. Anyway, Brelius or Brelius, I'm sure you'll tell me. You can join the club of people that have had to teach me their names. Uh, keep it up. Good work. Also, I want to throw into this video that Cartesian Caramel, one of the best, or no, I should say the best, Geometry Nodes user in the Blender community, that's quite a crown to have, has finally made another tutorial video. Well, kind of. They've been making a lot of live streams recently on their channel, and there's a bit of a running joke because I've mentioned them more than anyone else on this channel. He's one of my best friends, so because of this running joke I just felt like I had to mention their new video. Uh, there's a mesh unfolding effect in Blender 4.1. Let's take a quick look. As you can see here, it doesn't necessarily matter what the primitive shapes are made of, but you can make something unfold. I can imagine that being fantastic for like a vegetation work as well. So if you want to learn how to do this effect, then head on over to the channel. Speaking about revisiting people I've shared before, Ryan King Art, it's really nice to see how they've grown and just how much content they've been producing as well. Your output, Ryan, is really impressive to me. And I also appreciate this nice full circle moment where Ryan even decided to give me a shout out in their Blender channels to watch in 2024 video. Ryan is a lovely generalized tutorial creator who does all sorts of content. They are undeniably one of the best places to get random doses of Blender tips and inspiration. Okay, we've done some artwork, we've done some inspiration, let's go back to tools again. So this one was released a little while ago, but the people at Creative Shrimp, who also make a bunch of courses, you may know uh, the two main people behind Creative Shrimp as Gleb Alexandrov and AD Burrows, they released a Dust Particles Plus product, which basically helps you just get really cool dust effects using geometry nodes. It's all procedural, really quick and easy way to have like a lot of just realistic looking elements floating around in your scene for that sense of atmospherics. There is also a light version as well that is free, so if you're interested in visual effects, might be worth checking out. Oh, and of course, it would be wrong if I didn't mention that Creative Shrimp has also released a new course relating to creating nebulas in Blender. Now, this is also quite a callback to back in the early days of this YouTube channel. There was a bit of a trend going around where we were all trying to tackle nebula 
other effects in Blender, and I also did a tiny short film, I think, called Cosmic Drift back then. We were trying to use Eevee to make real-time nebulas, but there were quite a few limitations relating to lighting and shadowing, because the volumetric system was using this cards technique, which became very apparent in more complex lighting scenes. However, in this case, I think they're largely using cycles for the course. Learn the essentials of volume shaders and procedural noises and cycles. Get to know the geometry nodes, point cloud workflow and more. That's also using geo nodes. So this is a kind of more complex and comprehensive take on it. But if you're interested in science fiction effects and cosmic nebulae like this, then this seems to be now the go-to course to learn how to do that. Some of my old videos on the subject are now a little bit outdated. Maybe it's something I should return to in the future. So moving away from inspiration and tools, over on Twitter recently, Savannah XYZ or XYZ has caused a bit of a stir on Twitter. I say that, it's not drama or anything, it was just quite funny. They put this picture out and said, what 3D software opinion would have you like this? And so many people responded to it. Here's a little tip. If you're on Twitter, if you press on the repost icon and then go to view quotes, you can actually go and read a lot of the responses. So for example, Andrew Price, who did the Blender Donut tutorial, says it was a mistake to kill Blender's game engine. Ooh, controversial. Speaking of which, there are some people trying to keep the game engine alive. I believe it's called UPBGE. Might be worth looking into. Of course, the Blender game engine isn't the most popular thing, but it's nice to know that there's like a passion project of people trying to keep that alive and also keep it up to date with the new versions of Blender as well. Passive Star says numpad hotkeys is the biggest mistake in the history of Blender. Speaking of, Passive Star has been still making a lot of really cool tools, like node tools in Blender. I mentioned them in a recent community roundup as well. Undeniably, one of the most prolific people making node tools, just like looking through their Twitter feed, you can just see some insane things that they're making. How are you doing that non-uniform noise with soft selection? That's that's like, that's a modeling tool. That's not sculpting or anything. Crazy stuff, like an insane source of inspiration. I bet the Blender devs are looking at Passive Star's work going, we didn't even know you could do that with the node tools. Kaylin Dodds, Blender is industry standard and should be taught more openly in schools. I agree. Kaylin, by the way, is an integration artist at Riot, working on Valorant. Previously, Normal VR, Microsoft Flight Sim, interesting. Sushi Ben, Little Bang. So it's interesting kind of seeing how there are so many like professional and industry opinions that just descended on Savannah's post. Savannah, by the way, is someone that my Discord friend group printed out for the 2022 Blender conference, and then we ran around the Blender conference with a 3D print of Savannah so she could attend. And Render Rides did a nice short about this as well over on their channel. Again, Render Rides, lovely Blender channel and lovely person. Drexis Animations, another incredible artist who works at Bungie, said Blender is amazing but Eevee has missed out on key features and updates that it desperately needs. For years, it's severely lacking on some key things with performance, material nodes and lighting. Any isotropic shading hasn't worked since it dropped. I always have to fake it. So there are a lot of hot takes in this thread that I think the Blender devs might have an interesting time reading. Okay, we've shared a fair few things. Uh, I do have more to talk about. Maybe I'll leave that for the next video. But before we close up, I want to tell you about our casual sponsor. Again, Martin Spears, Not Important Studio. This is one you will want to pay attention to because it's actually quite clever. So if you're doing like product visualization type stuff in Blender or even diorama type scenes, or if you're trying to recreate studio environments in the Blender space, which is what a lot of marketing work is actually about, having realistic reflections can really make or break the final sense of realism for a render. You can just tell when something is CG when the reflection of a light, it's too perfect. It's too round, it's too consistent. Like when you see area lights in the reflections of spheres, you can see that square there and it's ugly and it's just emerging breaking. Now Martin has a background in photography and film, so it makes sense that they would have the intuition to pay attention to this, but what they've done is they've created a series of light packs that bring real life light shapers into the 3D space. So you can see here, they photograph the light shapers and using the light pack, if you pay attention to the comparisons, you can see how much of a difference having realistic light shapes makes on the surface of an object compared to something that's just basic, bog standard, CG, etc. They've crafted this pack to infuse more vibrant reflections and a sense of realism into your product renders and other Blender scenes. Includes up to 50 distinct light shapers, so that's quite a selection, elevating the realism. And what's more than this is they're adaptable. So let's take a look down here. The lights have layers, so by modifying the parameters, you can choose what type of diffuser the light has. And on the page, they've lovingly created a visual demonstration, so you can see the effect of adding a diffuser to the light makes. So it's almost like physically simulating modifying the light shaper in real life and then seeing that effect project onto your Blender scenes. A high end softbox has the option to remove its front diffuser to get a different reflection and then remove 
moving the middle diffuser to be a more direct light source. And again, it's just a matter of dragging sliders as well. You have control over the emission and the blur amount as well. So just if you want to have like a final soften effect over the surface, if it's something really glossy and you don't want to draw too much attention away from the actual mesh detail. And for more technical details, I recommend reading through the page to get a feel for what they're going for with the product. There's also stepped pricing in this as well. So you can start off for basically nothing and just try out an asset to see if it's something that you find easy to work with before upgrading to a single user license. So thank you for sponsoring this video, Martin. I wish you all the best with the product. Keep it up. I'm always interested in seeing more approaches to realistic lighting in Blender. And if you watching have made it to the end of this video, then please put, what should we do? It's a new year. Put a party emoji in the comments. And if you do that, I'll see if you did make it this far. Show me your familiar faces. If you want to sponsor a video, head on over to codisholt.online slash services. I have adjustable community friendly pricing as well. So independent people only pay a fraction of the price compared to large companies. So you have a fantastic day, everyone. Stay safe and I will see you next time.